Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this latest seminar in our uh, World Literature and Translation uh, series, which is co-convened uh, by the London Intercollegiate Network for Comparative Studies and the Institute of Modern Languages Research at the University of London. Um, this series seeks to bring together scholars working in, in languages, um, in London, the UK, and internationally, to consider um, the centrality of languages and translation in the study of world literatures. And we've seen uh, already throughout the series a host of interventions from colleagues working across the fields of modern languages, comparative literature, museum studies, the environmental humanities. And I'd like to thank um, all, all our uh, participants, all our speakers and audiences and in particular, uh, I'd like to thank um, our funder, uh, which is the University of London Convocation Trust. So before I introduce our speaker today for this uh, penultimate seminar in the series, I just wanted to go through, I'm sure you'll all be very aware of this by now, um, some housekeeping for Zoom. So the chat is open. You can post questions in the chat throughout the session and I can raise them with our speaker uh, during the Q&A at the end, or you can, you can raise your hand through the, the raise hand function in Zoom. Um, the session is being recorded, so if you don't wish to be recorded, then you can turn off your, you should turn off your video. Um, you can also, if you don't wish to be recorded, you can put your question to me in the chat and I can put it to our speaker uh, on your behalf. So um, for this um, kind of penultimate seminar in the series, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome uh, Michael Cronin, Professor Michael Cronin, who is a 1776 Professor of French and Director of the Centre for Literary and Cultural Translation in Trinity College, Dublin. Uh, among Michael's published titles are Translating Ireland, Translation, Languages and Identity, Across the Lines, Travel Language Translation, Translation and Globalization, Translation and Identity, Translation Goes to the Movies, Translation in the Digital Age, and uh, more recently, Eco-Translation, Translation and Ecology in the Age of the Anthropocene, and Irish and Ecology. Uh, Michael's a member of the Royal Irish Academy and a fellow of Trinity College Dublin, and his title today is Minor Oversight, Translation, World Literature, and Indigeneity. So I'm going to uh, pass over to our speaker without further ado. My Michael, thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Joe, for that very, very kind uh, introduction. And I would like to thank uh, everybody at the Institute and the University for this uh, very kind uh, opportunity to be able to speak to you uh, on a subject that's fairly uh, close to, to, to my heart. Uh, what I'm going to try and do this afternoon is um, I want to look uh, at the notion uh, of, uh, of, of world literature in terms of uh, how we think about the, the world uh, in world literature. Uh, then I want to uh, think about uh, translation um, and how that fits into, or changing definitions of translation uh, fit into that changing definition of the world in, in, in world literature. Um, and then I want to take uh, three uh, concepts. Um, one is uh, the notion of what I'm going to call translating uh, outdoors. Uh, secondly, there is the notion uh, of deep time uh, in uh, translation. Uh, and finally, uh, I want to look at a translation and the plantation of scene, uh, and where uh, translation, if you like, uh, comes to, 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 to figure in certain kind of configurations uh, of the, the, the world political and, and literary uh, order. Um, but I want to begin with a, uh, an extract uh, from a, uh, a film, uh, that came out in um, 1961. Uh, um, it was a film by uh, a man called uh, Eugène uh, Laurier. 
And the uh, film was called uh, Gorgo. Um, and I won't say too much uh, about uh, the film. I'm just going to show you the, 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 the trailer uh, from it um, and then uh, sort of situate it in, in terms of some of the issues that I want to look at uh, in, this, uh, in this lecture. So uh, hopefully the, uh, the technology uh, will, will work. picture of our time has ever unleashed shock spectacle of such scope and realism as up from the depths of prehistoric mystery rages Virgo. The headlines of the world plays the fabulous story of this monster from another age catapulted from some vast sub-ocean cavern by unprecedented volcanic action. And the headlines scream the story of the reckless skin divers who captured the monster and put it on exhibition. Sam! Pull out! Drop the net! What are you doing? Take it easy. I came to let him go back and see where he belongs. Why? Maybe to save their silly skins for you. Hurry, 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 to be Gorgo! But the headlines do not record the story of a little boy who had a curious sympathy and understanding for the fantastic creature. What strange secret does he know that scientists only suspect? You're trying to say there may be a fully grown one of these things around somewhere? How big would a full grown one be? An approximate guess. The infant. The adult. That will make it nearly 200 feet tall. Wreaking terrible vengeance against the civilization that has captured its offspring. Towering over the cities of the world as millions flee its awesome terror. <laughs> Nothing can stop it. Defying the force of the army. The might of the Navy. Line number one, Tony. Ready to open fire, sir. Fire one. Even the fury of the jets. In a striking crescendo of fights never before beheld by human eyes. And adventures never before experienced by any man or woman. Um, so, um you may ask yourself, uh, what is uh, this uh, film uh, uh, about? Um, basically, what happens is you get these sort of two um, divers, uh, Joe Ryan and Sam Slade, and they turn up uh, off the west coast uh, of Ireland um, near the island of, of Nara. So this is the uh, Arm uh, spelt backwards, one of the backwards, one of the islands off the west coast of Ireland. Um, and their ship uh, runs into to problems because of some strange movements uh, in, the, uh, in the sea uh, and they uh, come uh, ashore. Now what's interesting is the moment of when the two uh, come ashore is um, their first experience, if you like, is, is linguistic. Um, uh, the, uh, they, they address uh, the islanders uh, in uh, English uh, and the islanders uh, answer back to them uh, in their own language and their own language is, uh, is, is Irish. Now what's kind of interesting is um, that Joe Ryan, uh, one of the characters, uh, basically uh, he, he says uh, to his, his companion um, that he, uh, whatever they're saying uh, doesn't quite sound uh, like welcome in uh, any uh, language. Uh, but the other uh, companion uh, reveals um, a knowledge uh, of uh, uh, Irish and uh, uh, translates in a very partial way uh, what the, uh, the natives uh, are, are, are saying. And of course, it's from the island of, of, of Nara uh, that the two divers eventually come upon uh, this creature, uh, the Gorgo, uh, which they then take 
uh, to uh, London uh, to become part uh, of uh, a circus in, in Battersea uh, Funfair. Um, and uh, this in, in turn uh, leads uh, to the arrival uh, of the, 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 the mother uh, who seeks uh, to uh, retrieve her, uh, her child. Um, and despite the kind of the massed uh, military uh, firepower, um, the uh, the, the mother is eventually able to uh, retrieve uh, her uh, a child and they return to the, uh, to the sea. Um, what is interesting, um, if you like, about this uh, film, uh, which it has to be said uh, was a complete uh, box uh, office flop, uh, unlike um, its successor, uh, Godzilla, um, is the, the kind of the, what happens uh, initially uh, when the, the divers uh, arrive uh, off this uh, island is that it's, it's a site of tension and the tension is around translation. The tension is around communicability. But of course, the other aspect of this particular site, the, the island uh, where the uh, divers arrive looking for, uh, for treasure, is that in the, the words of Naomi Klein, uh, this is a classic sacrifice zone. Uh, this is a site of extractivism, people extracting uh, treasure, extracting uh, resources. It's a site uh, where uh, an indigenous people are speaking a minority uh, language which experiences severe uh, economic uh, dispossession um, and uh, which makes them, if you like, particularly vulnerable uh, to forms uh, of uh, outside uh, presence uh, or uh, invasiveness. And of course, what we see in, in the film itself, and this is where the, the, the kind of the logic of the film is, is flipped in a particular way, um, is um, that it's not just a question of the translational relations uh, between uh, the humans um, that are there, the different languages that are spoken, uh, the minor language, the major language, uh, Irish Gaelic uh, and, uh, and, and English, uh, but also uh, the kind of communicative relationships uh, between uh, the undersea uh, creatures uh, and the uh, and, and the humans. Um, one of the repeated phrases that we hear uh, from the uh, the islanders um, as they're sort of rowing around uh, in one or uh, in, in the harbour is uh, in Irish Gaelic uh, what uh, will we uh, do uh, now um, so I, I want to take this uh, notion of uh, what will we uh, do now uh, to think uh, about or to explore if you like some of the uh, implications of this translation uh, crisis uh, for uh, how we think about uh, translation uh, in the present moment and what some of the implications of that might be uh, for uh, translation uh, itself uh, and the, the notion of, of, of world uh, literature. Um, I want to um, begin with a, a definition um, uh, from... Um, a very recent uh, book by uh, Jennifer Deer uh, on um, the notion of, of radical uh, animism. Um, and uh, in there are kind of introductory uh, remarks uh, to the uh, to her work. Um, she talks about um, the, the, the sort of the etymological sense of the word uh, world. Um, coming from the old Danish uh, uh, the uh, age uh, of, of man. So the, 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 the word world uh, literally uh, meaning uh, man uh, age. Um, and what she advocates for uh, in her book, Radical uh, Animism, is um, a, a, a reading uh, uh, for the end uh, of the, uh, the world. But it's, it's a reading, if you like, in favor uh, of uh, the end of the age of, of, of man. Uh, in this sense, it's a, it's a reading, as she says, for uh, the end of the uh, uh, Elt. Um, so if that is the, 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 the case then, um, if we are going to kind of uh, redefine uh, or, or rethink 
uh, a notion uh, of, 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 of world. Um, and uh, in particular, uh, or particularly in, in the context uh, of uh, a deliberation about or thinking about uh, world uh, literature, um, what kind of lesson should we take uh, from uh, Deere's uh, assertion there? Uh, one of the things um, to be said about um, the, 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 the form of radical animism um, that Deere is, is, is advocating um, is not the extinction uh, of, of humans. Uh, we will come to this uh, in, in, in a moment. Um, in other words, that when she talks about uh, the end of one world and the beginning uh, of, of, of another, um, she um, means the end of a world where humans um, narcissistically act uh, as they, as if they were uh, um, not uh, dependent on, as if they were somehow um, separable from uh, other uh, living uh, beings. And her, her notion uh, of, of, of life it, itself is something that is generalized uh, beyond the uh, organically uh, living. So this is very much in tune uh, with the kind of work that people like Jane Bennett have been doing on uh, active uh, materialism. Because what Deere argues is uh, that there have been, if you like, um, three successive blows to human uh, narcissism. Um, the first being um, the Copernican uh, blow, uh, so the uh, replacement uh, of the uh, androcentric uh, universe uh, by the uh, heliocentric uh, universe, the geocentric universe by the, the heliocentric uh, universe. Uh, the second is the Darwinian uh, uh, revolution, uh, es establishing, if you like, a community uh, or a collective commonality uh, with uh, other uh, animal species. Um, and what she sees as the Freudian uh, revolution uh, with its uh, calling into question of the supremacy uh, of a particular notion uh, of the rational human subject. And what she uh, argues is the fourth blow is, uh, is climate uh, change. Um, but what, if you like, differentiates this blow uh, to human narcissism uh, from the three others is that it has its uh, uh, origins in uh, non-human uh, uh, agency. Now, I think to some extent um, what um, Deere is uh, arguing uh, for uh, here um, can be uh, linked to uh, obviously a lot of debates um, in, in post-humanism uh, around notions of transversal uh, subjectivity articulated by, by thinkers like Rosie Bredotti, uh, where um, the notion uh, of uh, subjectivity um, is uh, extended to include uh, the relationship uh, of humans uh, to uh, non-humans uh, and all of the entities that make up uh, the more than human uh, world. The, if you like, where I sort of uh, come into this uh, particular uh, debate from a translation studies uh, perspective um, is the question uh, around uh, the nature of that relationality. In other words, if we're talking about uh, an ontology of relationality, um, and if we are at the same time acknowledging as, as, as we must, again, we, we, we see this as a recurring theme in the, the lecture, um, the, the notion of, of, of difference and uh, alterity. Um, how do we think about uh, a notion uh, of a communication uh, across a difference? Uh, and one of the things that I would uh, argue is that why uh, translation uh, and thinking about translation is so central uh, to any kind of rethinking uh, of uh, the world uh, in, in world literature is that it is an, an attempt to think through uh, some of the communicative uh, implications uh, and challenges uh, of this uh, relational uh, ontology. Um, if we look at uh, translation uh, studies um, itself and the thinking that has been done about uh, translation uh, over uh, time, particularly this, the second half of the, uh, the 20th uh, century, uh, I think it's fair to say um, that there has been um, a, a kind of, of, of a shift uh, or, or, or a move or certainly a kind of an epistemic uh, challenge um, that has involved uh, a movement uh, from what I call the ethnocentric paradigm 
to the geocentric paradigm uh, to uh, what uh, I, I call the, the terracentric uh, paradigm. Let me just explain uh, briefly uh, in turn what each of these uh, notions mean. So the, the ethnocentric is basically uh, an approach uh, to uh, translated uh, literature uh, in terms of what happens in a particular uh, site. Um, uh, so you look at um, what happens when literature gets translated in Germany, what happens when it gets translated in France, what happens when it gets translated in Ireland, what happens when it gets translated in Scotland, what happens when it gets translated in India, uh, Kenya, and uh, uh, elsewhere. Uh, in other words, that the primary focus um, of the uh, translation uh, analysis and the role uh, of uh, translation in, in, in literature is how do these exterior, how do these kind of exogenous uh, forces uh, influence uh, the internal or endogenous uh, developments uh, of style, uh, cultural uh, perspectives, uh, political uh, aesthetic uh, in involvements and, and, and so on. And, and this was certainly uh, a form uh, of, 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 of research, of thinking uh, about uh, translation and, and, and literature uh, that would be uh, very much to the fore uh, in the, uh, the 80s and, and 90s. And one thing I should say about, of course, all of these uh, paradigms is that they are kind of uh, overlapping. And I, I don't wish to kind of create a, an artificial uh, rupture, schismatic uh, distinction between uh, any uh, of them. Um, what we find in the the 2000s um, and uh, beginning sort of late 1990s, uh, and this is you know, partly in, in response uh, to uh, the discussions uh, around uh, globalization uh, and world systems uh, theory and so on, um, is the shift to thinking about uh, translation in terms of the global uh, transnational movements uh, of uh, ideas, uh, languages, uh, notions, uh, perspectives, uh, literatures, uh, writers, um, that the, um, the, the emphasis here and, and the, the kind of the key term uh, is very often uh, the, the notion uh, of a flux in, 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 in various ways. And that's why it's interesting if you look at, at a work like uh, Pascal uh, Casanova's uh, World of Public of Letters, it's almost that sort of interface uh, between uh, geocentric and uh, ethnocentric uh, uh, paradigms. Um, what is uh, emerging um, now, it, it seems to me, um, is um, a, a thinking uh, about um, translation from a, a terra uh, centric uh, perspective. Uh, and this is basically the kind of, of, of notion um, that uh, one uh, looks at uh, local uh, sites uh, of, of translation, uh, but these local uh, sites uh, of, of translation um, are connected to uh, not only the, the, the human, but the, 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 the more than human. So there's a kind of a transversality uh, that comes out uh, of this. So um, one of the things that I will be, um, if you like, uh, trying to suggest uh, in, 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 in the lecture or explore, if you like, is um, what kind uh, or what ways um, or what kinds of challenges uh, from a translation and a literary perspective uh, are thrown up uh, by this notion uh, of the, uh, the terracentric uh, paradigm. Um, one of the um, important uh, contributions in terms of, of, of creating part of the conceptual landscape uh, for the terracentric uh, paradigm has been the work uh, of uh, certain thinkers um, such as uh, Cobus Mare um, who have uh, looked into uh, the area of uh, uh, biosemiotics uh, um, principally with uh, a view to uh, thinking about or freeing uh, translation from a particular kind of, of, of legacy. Um, in Murray's um, a Biosemiotic Theory of Translation, the Emergence of Social uh, Cultural, uh, Social Cultural Reality, um, he makes the uh, following uh, argument. 
uh, basically um, that what has uh, enormously constrained uh, translation studies in terms of its sort of epistemic um, purchase uh, on many, many uh, areas uh, of political, aesthetic, social, and cultural life um, has been um, an excessively uh, narrow uh, definition uh, of translation, which itself is based on a kind of distortion, almost uh, a mistranslation, or certainly um, a, a narrow in interpretation uh, of uh, what uh, translation is, uh, is about. Um, so um, the definition of, of translation, uh, widely uh, used, uh, widely uh, quoted, uh, widely uh, circulated, um, is uh, Jakobsen's uh, definition. Um, the meaning of any lingual sign is its translation into some further alternative sign, especially a sign in which it is more fully developed. And Jakobsen, when he puts forward this definition, uh, acknowledges his indebtedness uh, to Peirce. He, you know, he, he, he argues that there's a kind of Persian prehistory uh, for the formulation of this uh, particular definition uh, of, of translation. But of course, what Peirce uh, argued, um, or the way in which he formulated this kind of um, notion of translation, was the conception of a meaning, which is in its primary acceptation, the translation of a sign into another system of signs. So in other words, in, in Peirce's notion uh, of what it is translation does, um, there is no mention of the lingual sign. Uh, there's no kind of narrowing or constriction uh, of the sign uh, to, uh, to the lingual, uh, which of course means then the kind of Jacobsonian legacy um, is uh, that the notion uh, of translation has been seen uh, almost exclusively um, in uh, interlingual uh, uh, terms. Um, so uh, what one can uh, take from this, I think, is um, that one of the things that the work of, of people like Mare and, and other is to open up a kind of a conceptual space uh, in which we can explore uh, these terracentric uh, paradigms in uh, greater uh, detail. Um, so um, uh, Mahé's um, uh, definition uh, of, of translation uh, is as a negentropic semiotic work performed by an agent uh, in which any or any one or more of the components in the sign system, any more of the relationships between them are changed, on which the relationship between the sign and its environment, time and or space is, is changed. Um, so uh, one of the things uh, that is immediately apparent there is the, uh, the extraordinary kind of flexibility, the sort of conceptual spaces uh, that are opened up uh, by the, the definition and the way in which um, it is uh, compatible uh, with certain uh, hermeneutic uh, understandings uh, of, of translation uh, that uh, are with us uh, from the uh, Romantic uh, period uh, uh, onwards. Um, in the um, work that was alluded to uh, briefly by Joe in his introductory remarks, uh, Eco uh, Translation, um, I, I have um, argued um, that, uh, and this is something, if you like, that's borne out by kind of researchers who work in the area of, of biosemiotics and zoosemiotics, um, is that uh, all of the entities that we find in the more than human world uh, are capable. Uh, of uh, receiving, uh, storing, and emitting uh, inf information. Uh, and they exist, of course, in entangled relationships uh, with uh, each, uh, each other. Um, and uh, one of the ways then of conceiving um, uh, the, 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 the world in which, uh, we, uh, which we inhabit um, is to conceive of it as a, a, a tratosphere. Um, a, a tratosphere meaning in my understanding, um, the collection uh, of all the signifying uh, systems uh, in our, our world um, and the way in which these uh, signifying systems uh, enter uh, into uh, communication uh, with uh, each uh, other. Um, why should this uh, matter, if you like, um, in terms uh, of uh, how uh, translation uh, figures um, in uh, uh, debates, whether they be political, uh, social, uh, cultural, uh, or, uh, or, or, or literary. Um, 
let, let me begin, if, if you like, with, 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 with the, 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 the political um, and um, before uh, moving uh, into the, 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 the aesthetic. Uh, one of the points um, that uh, is made by uh, the French uh, thinker and writer on uh, animal rights, uh, uh, Émile Caron, in his um, uh, book from 2019, uh, sorry, 2017, uh, Antispeciste, um, is that uh, when we look at uh, what he calls a human moral uh, development, uh, it comes from what he calls uh, the, the broadening of the circle uh, of understanding. Uh, in other words, it's particular groups uh, in the society um, who um, are previously regarded as beyond the pale uh, of uh, human uh, recognition, um, but that um, uh, at a particular point, um, they are, are no longer kind of positivistic uh, objects uh, of uh, observation, uh, exploitation uh, and subordination, uh, but they become hermeneutic uh, subjects uh, that uh, have a particular uh, entitlements. Um, so he would see uh, the evolution uh, of uh, women's rights in, in various societies, uh, the rights uh, of groups of people uh, with different uh, sexual uh, orientation, um, the uh, gradual uh, abolition uh, of, of, of slavery. Um, that what happens is that there's a, a broadening uh, of what he calls the sphere of, of moral uh, consideration. Um, but the, what uh, Caron does not mention is, of course, um, that presupposes um, what I would call uh, a communicative uh, intervention. Uh, in other words, um, that the, uh, the groups uh, that are, are, are recognized, the groups that become, in, 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 uh, that, if you like, are literally accorded speaking rights as hermeneutic uh, subjects, um, um, are brought into this uh, communicative um, circle. Um, so if we are, and this is what he, he, he asked for in, in his, his book, uh, to expand uh, that sphere of moral consideration uh, to give uh, uh, rights, uh, legal rights uh, to, uh, or expanded, greatly expanded uh, rights to animals uh, to uh, liberate them uh, from uh, cruelty, uh, harm, and uh, enslavement. Um, we must address, it seems to me, um, that question uh, of, of translation, that question of communication across uh, uh, difference. Um, Serge uh, Audier, in his uh, book uh, La Cité uh, Écologique, uh, which uh, appeared uh, last year, um, argues uh, for what he calls a biotic democracy. And what he means by that um, is uh, that the, uh, the societies in which uh, we uh, live um, have become aware through uh, climate change uh, of um, the overriding importance uh, of considering uh, the more than human, uh, if uh, human species, for example, are to uh, survive. Um, so in other words, it's not possible to talk about the survival of democracy uh, if you're not going to factor in uh, the, uh, the more than, than human, because the more than human now has uh, an agentive presence uh, in uh, de democracies, as we can see, for example, uh, with the uh, COVID-19 virus and, and the pandemic. Um, so in other words, that any proper understanding of, of, the, of, of democracy and the viability uh, of uh, democracy um, must in include uh, the more uh, than, than, than human, hence the notion of uh, biotic uh, democracy. But if that is the case then, it seems to me that, that one of the things uh, that we have to think about is uh, precisely uh, how we're going to establish some kind of communicative uh, commonality. Uh, and if we're going to establish some kind of communicative commonality, uh, where does translation come into the picture, or how does this help to think about or to problematize uh, that communicative uh, commonality? So in other words, um, if we are to uh, make a move towards uh, what I call a, a, a zoonocracy, um, so uh, a form of uh, uh, democratic uh, organization uh, that respects 
um, the democratic rights uh, of all the uh, living uh, entities uh, in uh, our world, uh, I think we've got to take uh, the question uh, of uh, translation uh, seriously. And I think uh, part uh, of the, <coughs> the, the, the seriousness of this question, or part, a part of the way in which we have to think about this question, uh, will uh, bring us on to the question uh, of the world in which uh, literature is, uh, is, is, is written. Um, so uh, one of the ways in which uh, this question is, uh, is, is addressed um, is um, uh, through uh, the area of uh, particular forms uh, of, uh, of studies of animal uh, communication uh, and animal communication uh, married uh, to uh, research in uh, artificial uh, in, in intelligence, um, which illustrated by this uh, work by Khan uh, Slobodjikov, um, where uh, he, he argues that, this, that the, kind of the, the, the ethical purpose behind his attempt uh, to understand uh, animal communication systems uh, is uh, to, uh, to save uh, uh, or to, uh, to, 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 um, to in include uh, animals uh, in a much more inclusive or expanded uh, notion of what might constitute a uh, democratic uh, community. But of course, um, there is uh, a danger um, in, in this. Um, and um, this is uh, where I, I want to bring in a, uh, a concept um, that has been uh, widely circulated in debates uh, around translation and, and world literature that has been um, popularized um, by uh, thinkers uh, like uh, Barbara Cassin, uh, Emily Apter, and others. And this is, of course, the notion uh, of untranslatability, which has now become a highly contested notion uh, in translation and comparative literature. But let me just stick with the, the notion for a moment. And um, this uh, extract, which is uh, taken from uh, Patricia McCormack's uh, very recent book, The A Human uh, Manifesto, Activism for the End of the, the Anthropocene. And basically uh, what uh, McCormack uh, argues um, and is for uh, abolitionism, that the, the, the damage that humans have done to the more than human world is so enormous uh, is so sustained um, that the, the best thing uh, for humans to do is to abolish themselves. Um, so she would favor uh, antinatalism, uh, suicide, uh, what she calls uh, death uh, activism. But as part of uh, articulating this radical manifesto, she says abolitionists are activists against all use of animals, acknowledging that communication is fatally human. So we can never know modes of non-human communication, and to do so is both hubris and materially detrimental to non-humans. In other words, the only ethical uh, stance uh, in this uh, situation is a situation of zero translation, uh, acknowledging a kind of radical uh, untranslatability, not a form of untranslatability that gives rise uh, to further translatability, um, but uh, a radical form of uh, zero uh, translation. Um, one of the uh, most um, ferocious uh, uh, and vociferous uh, critics um, of uh, the notion uh, of um, untranslatability um, is the um, Translation studies critic um, uh, Lawrence uh, Venuti. I, I, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd a quote from um, Lawrence Venuti's um, recent work here on the uh, the slide, but um, I, I, I can um, say it to you. He basically what Venuti argues is that uh, untranslatability is uh, a term that is uh, extremely. Uh, harmful, um, because what it seems to uh, in, in, in imply um, is, or, or, or what it, it props up, is an instrumentalist notion of uh, communication. Uh, in other words, um, an idea uh, that um, there is some kind of semantic invariant uh, 
as something that is ineffable, indescribable uh, in a literary text, um, and that the attempts uh, to try and capture this uh, in uh, another uh, text are, are inevitably uh, doomed uh, to a failure. So what he calls translation cliché, um, so poetry is what gets lost in translation, translator, tra traitor, and, and so on. Um, what is, is ensures, if you like, uh, the long life um, of these uh, translation uh, cliches or proverbs of translation is, is another a term that he uses, um, is this instrumental notion of the semantic uh, in, in, in invariant. Um, what I want to do is, um, if you could just um, hold this notion uh, for uh, a, a moment. Um, as um, I take um, a, a very brief passage from the a book by the Swiss uh, travel writer uh, Sarah Marquis, um, which uh, originally appeared uh, in uh, 2013 as a Sauvage par Nature and appears in English translation in 2017, uh, Wild by, by Nature. So uh, describing uh, her, 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 her trek uh, across um, uh, Siberia, Australia, uh, the Gobi uh, Desert through Laos and, and Thailand. And she talks about an experience that she has uh, when she's in the outback in Australia. It says, two years have put me in a blur. And now the fog suddenly lifts. The edges become clear. The colors seem perfect. My transformation took all these steps all this time. Today I realize that nature lives within me. I am she. She is part of me. Wow. I spend days digesting this harmonic energy with mother nature that's so difficult to describe. So here there's almost a, a, a moment um, of this sort of communicative commonality, a, a, a moment of sort of uh, almost pure uh, translation uh, fusion uh, in, in the old kind of uh, uh, Roman rhetorical terms, a sort of sense for a sense, a translation uh, from the, uh, the human into the uh, natural uh, world. Um, and um, uh, bringing, uh, so suggesting at, at, at one level um, that there is a kind of um, uh, translative potential uh, in uh, literature uh, for uh, crossing or transversing uh, that particular uh, human uh, more uh, than human uh, uh, divide. Um, but of course, um, this is uh, only part uh, of the, uh, the picture. And this is the, uh, the quote uh, from uh, Venuti that I was looking for. Uh, to promote a notion of untranslatability, so as to stigmatize and rule out the study of translation in its many forms, humanistic, pragmatic, and technical, as well as the institutional and economic conditions in which it is practiced, any such exclusion is effectively to abdicate the status quo by withdrawing from the areas where social struggles can occur. Um, so what happens uh, in uh, Marquis is, uh, I would argue, a kind of, uh, not so much a kind of notion of pure translatability, on the one hand, nor is it a, a notion of pure untranslatability uh, on the other, um, but rather, and this is what you find uh, in the text, uh, in, in Marquis' uh, text, is precisely uh, the kind of uh, thing uh, that uh, Venuti is talking about when he talks about uh, the, the necessity of thinking about translatability uh, is that she is constantly uh, in this kind of uh, negotiation uh, with the more than a human uh, world, uh, where um, there is often a profound uh, ambivalence uh, with respect to her encounters with wolves, uh, scorpions, uh, the kind of the climactic uh, difficulties of traversing uh, the Gobi uh, Desert, um, and where um, there is um, a sense in which, uh, in the words of the uh, eco-feminist scholar uh, Val Plumwood, um, she conceives of herself as having this kind of life membership in an ecological community of kindred beings, but she's constantly brought up sharp uh, by the limits to her understanding, the limits to her knowledge, the kinds of communicative uh, difficulties that she has, 
uh, engaging uh, with uh, various forms of non-human agency and attempting to translate that non-human agency uh, into some form of uh, action uh, or behavior uh, or perspective uh, that uh, will uh, allow her to uh, engage with and live in that, uh, in that world. So what I want to do now um, is to uh, look at um, uh, three uh, key uh, areas, um, which um, I think um, uh, offer us different takes, uh, different uh, perspectives uh, on this uh, notion uh, of uh, translatability and uh, translation uh, with respect to the uh, more than human uh, in, 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 in the context uh, of uh, literature and the, uh, and the world. Um, the first um, point relates to this uh, notion uh, of um, thinking uh, outdoors. Uh, one of the points um, that has been uh, made by the um, ecological uh, activist, the Moroccan ecological activist uh, Pierre Rabhi, um, is um, that uh, humans spend an inordinate amount of times indoors. Um, we complain about the pandemic, we complain about lockdown, we complain uh, about uh, how COVID uh, is restricting our movement in various places. Um, but what people like Abi and others would argue is that we've been in institutional lockdown all our lives. Uh, from uh, preschool to primary school, uh, to, uh, to secondary school, uh, to university, uh, to uh, government buildings, uh, corporate offices, uh, we spend all of our time uh, indoors. Um, as he said, as he said, de la maternelle jusqu'à l'université, ils vivent en enfermement. So from preschool to university, humans uh, are kept inside. Um, so what uh, Chris uh, Arthur, the uh, uh, political uh, thinker has uh, written uh, recently is that millions of us become more, more defined by the time we spend indoors than outside. As a result, we've lost touch with the natural world. Those with the most pronounced indoor sensibilities can't identify even the commonest species of birds, insects, and plants in their uh, locality. Uh, so to what extent then, this is the kind of the question uh, that Arthur and Rabi are, are asking, uh, is there a sense in which our, our modes of thought, um, our ways of conceptualizing, uh, are profoundly uh, influenced uh, by this kind of indoors uh, experience. Um, so that, that uh, the, the, the kind of you know, Descartes' invitation uh, to, 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 to read the great book uh, of the, the, the world, uh, we read uh, the great book uh, of the world, um, but it's uh, the world uh, that gets collapsed uh, into uh, the book, uh, uh, rather than uh, the experience of, of the outside uh, coming uh, into uh, the uh, book uh, itself. Um, so in, in this recent uh, work, um, which is, is, is bi bilingual, it's sort of um, two extended essays, one in the Irish language, one in the English language, um, that I, I wrote, I, I was trying to think uh, about um, what the implications would be in terms of uh, the teaching or instruction uh, in uh, Irish Gaelic of taking it out of the classroom and bringing it uh, into the, the world that it has narrated, uh, described uh, for uh, over uh, 2,000 uh, years. But I want to, uh, in the context of this lecture, um, to think um, more specifically uh, of the question of, of translation uh, and, uh, and, and world and, and literature. Because uh, if we look at uh, one of the kind of the iconic figures in, in the Western tradition in thinking about uh, translation, we have two radically different uh, ways uh, of iconographically representing uh, Saint uh, Jerome. Uh, one is the image uh, of Jerome uh, in his uh, studio. Um, he's uh, fully uh, dressed, 
Um, he's uh, surrounded uh, by the, uh, the tools of his trade. Um, there is furniture in the, the form of tables, uh, chairs, uh, lecterns, and, and so on. But the other uh, image, uh, the other iconographic representation uh, of Jerome uh, is of uh, Jerome in, in the wilderness, uh, Jerome uh, outdoors, uh, Jerome uh, outside uh, caves, uh, and very often uh, then in the, the, this, this particular iconographic representation uh, of uh, Jerome, uh, we find the presence of a non-human, we find the presence uh, of the line, we find the, 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 the presence uh, of uh, another uh, species. Um, so as we shift, if you like, uh, from uh, indoors translation uh, to outdoors uh, translation, we find uh, the movement from intraspecies translation to the potential uh, move uh, to uh, interspecies uh, uh, translation. Um, I want to um, try and, 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 and think about um, what the notion uh, of uh, outdoors um, translation uh, might uh, look like. Uh, it, with uh, an example that's taken uh, from a uh, uh, vernacular uh, indigenous uh, now minority language uh, from the 18th century, it was on its way uh, to uh, minoritization uh, uh, even in that uh, period, uh, and that is uh, Irish uh, Gaelic. And I want to um, look in particular at a verse, a stanza from a, a poem uh, that was um, composed about um, this uh, mountain uh, that uh, you see uh, be, be, be before you, uh, which is in the northwest uh, of uh, Ireland, uh, in, in Donegal, a place called uh, Schlieve uh, League. Um, so um, the writer uh, of this uh, poem is a man called uh, Seamus O'Dirhan. Um, and uh, so Seamus uh, is uh, writing um, this uh, poem in, in, in homage uh, to this particular uh, place. Um, and he says, It's like Saul Knochanonia to Kurskial is Polish, Il Wali Bona Ags Toplish in a sleeve. Is Gamor of Jean Chantleva a gloss in the cater on Bancha, a son firsta is a lehage as Gachtir. Be slowed of no Jagach Dula da Edi is Kloshuk or Hedi on Rega August Peel. So in, um, in a kind of uh, an English uh, crib, um, the uh, translation uh, of uh, that. Um, Poem would be at the bottom of Canucha and Anya. There are bright yards and parlors, whitewashed walls, and players seated to chess. Hundreds come to the great hostelries of the mountain for play and feasting, and they come from every uh, country. There are a host of comely, well dressed uh, women from Greece, and harp strings are played. And, and, and pipes. Um, now, what's interesting about this particular uh, poem um, is uh, the notion that you have this site that is outdoors, you have this poem that is written uh, by this uh, prominent uh, uh, geographical and geological uh, feature uh, in the, uh, the landscape of the, uh, the northwest uh, of, of Ireland. Um, but the way in which the poem is, is, is conceptualized or, or, or formulated is uh, drawn on a particular uh, translation tradition uh, in the, uh, the language, uh, which is, is basically um, the translation of a classical uh, epic, uh, a Greek and Latin classical uh, epic uh, into uh, Irish uh, from the, uh, the 10th uh, century uh, onwards. Um, so we get a uh, translation of Ulysses, we get the translation uh, of the Aeneid, we get the translation of Estatius uh, Tibiad, um, we get the translation of Lucan's uh, Pharsalia. Um, so what happens then is that these uh, uh, texts get translated uh, into uh, the uh, indigenous uh, vernacular. Um, uh, these are uh, circulated uh, in manuscript uh, form. Um, these uh, then uh, inform uh, the wider uh, vernacular uh, tradition. Uh, and then these the, the kind of these translations tropes and, 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 and images then uh, inform the kinds of, of poetry uh, that uh, are written uh, about uh, the uh, geo 
geological or geographical uh, features uh, of the uh, the landscape. Um, so what we 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 get from this then is um, the the notion of sites of translation, uh, which was. Um, first advocated by uh, Sherry Simon in her translation sites uh, field guide, uh, where she says in her introduction that, that the aim is to follow my roots, is to visit gardens, bridges and streets where spaces are charged with the tension between here and, and elsewhere. Uh, and Sherry Simon in her, in her work uh, con concentrates um, mainly uh, on, um, on built uh, infrastructures, uh, buildings uh, that contain people uh, inside. Um, but what we, um, if you like, if, if we begin to think about translating outdoors, uh, if we th begin to think about uh, the different uh, traditions that Eduardo Vélez de Castro has written about in terms of Amerindian uh, cosmologies, um, if we think about uh, Maori uh, cosmologies uh, and the way in which uh, poems uh, are, uh, are, are, are written and, and the link between uh, literature and uh, geological uh, and, and geographical uh, features, um, what we find uh, is the way in which um, well, what is happening is there's a kind of translation uh, outdoors uh, where the activity uh, of, of translation is one that embraces uh, the uh, more than, uh, than human. Um, I'm, I'm aware of, 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 of time, of course, uh, um, uh, marching uh, on, and this is probably uh, uh, appropriately uh, the time to say uh, a word or two about the notion of, of, of deep time and, and where I think it comes into our conversation uh, around uh, literature and uh, world literature and, and translation. Um, one of the, 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 the points uh, that was um, made uh, famously by uh, Dipesh Chakrabarti uh, in his uh, Climate of History uh, for Theses um, was um, that one of the consequences of, of climate change uh, were uh, humans uh, have now assumed a geological force uh, where the cumulative effect of human activities is uh, equivalent to or similar uh, to uh, the shift of tectonic plates or the eruption uh, of uh, volcanoes, um, is the convergence of human history and history of life uh, on, the, uh, on the planet. In other words, uh, the, the, the necessity uh, to develop uh, a notion uh, of uh, deep uh, history. And of course, this notion uh, of um, deep uh, history uh, is also taken up um, by Daniel Lord uh, Smale, his book on deep history uh, uh, on, on the brain, where he, he argues that one of the, the difficulties about our, our, our thinking uh, about history is uh, our, our confinement uh, to the notion uh, of the, and the, the written. And he says, you know, what does it matter if the evidence from the deep past comes not from written documents, from the other things that teach from artifacts, fossils, vegetable remains, phonemes, and various forms of modern DNA. Like written documents, all these traces encode information about the past. Um, like written documents, they resist an easy reading and must be interpreted uh, with uh, care. Well, it seems to me um, that that is precisely uh, what is uh, happening in terms of um, how uh, we uh, might uh, think about uh, the relationship uh, between translation itself and, and, and deep time. In, in Robert McFarlane's uh, Underland, um, where he ex explores, if you like, uh, underground uh, places uh, across uh, the world uh, from the, the London tube uh, to nuclear uh, storage uh, facilities, he talks about um, that when he um, goes uh, down underground uh, and explores the limestone landscapes uh, of, uh, of Somerset um, or goes through uh, Epping Forest in, in London and looks at the kind of fungal networks, what he calls the, the wood wide uh, web uh, that allows communication uh, between different uh, trees. He says, when uh, viewed in deep time, things come alive that seem in earth. New responsibilities declare themselves, a conviviality of being leaps to mind and eye. The world becomes eerily various and vibrant again. Ice breeds, rock as tides, mountains ebb and flow, stone pulses. We live on a restless uh, earth. So basically what um, uh, McFarlane is arguing is that once we begin to shift that kind of time uh, frame um, and uh, people 
uh, like uh, Roman uh, Krishnarik uh, argued that this is absolutely vital uh, to the uh, survival of our species. Uh, we must learn to be good ancestors. We must learn to develop the seven generation thinking that is characteristic of many indigenous uh, forms uh, of, of thought. Um, that once we develop this, uh, we begin to get a, a sense uh, of, 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 of dynamism and, 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 and fluidity. But in order to, um, to think about that, it seems to me, um, this is where uh, literature um, uh, comes into the picture and, 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 and various literatures uh, around the world. So what I mean by this is the way in which uh, writers um, um, think um, about uh, that encounter with the more than human, uh, think about a notion of, of, of deep time, but are haunted uh, by a kind of translational uh, uncertainty. Um, in Olga Pekarczuk's um, Drive Your Plough Over the Bones of the Dead, um, towards the end of, of the novel, when she's kind of justifying or, or explaining her uh, actions, um, she talks about one of the, the early kind of um, premonitory uh, moments uh, where she felt compelled to act against um, the destructive extractivist practice uh, of the hunters in her border region between Poland and the Czech Republic. And she says, and she talks about the deer, they appeared before me like the stag to St. Uh, Hubert. Uh, to have me be became the punitive hand of justice in secret, not just for the deers, but for other animals too, for they have no voice uh, in Parliament. In other words, um, and remember that what um, Janina, the, uh, the main character in Tukarczyk's book is doing, is she's translating, she's translating a uh, Blake into Polish. Uh, but she's not just engaged, if you like, in a form of linguistic translation, she's also en engaged in a kind of interspecies uh, translation. She's engaged, if you like, or engaging with a kind of terracentric uh, paradigm uh, in trying to establish uh, some kind uh, of uh, form of zoonocratic uh, justice uh, in the world uh, in which uh, she inhabits. But of course, what she is uh, aware of, and this is articulated again and again uh, in the, the, the novel, and it's picked up in, in, in various ways in, in flights as well, is that what we're dealing with here are translational hyperobjects. In other words, that the deer that she sees are part of a species that has been there for a very long time. Uh, time. Equally uh, with the geological uh, features in the landscape, she comes aware of the fact that in uh, Timothy Morton's uh, terms, that we're talking about hyper objects. We're talking about objects that are extended in space and time, which produces a sense uh, of the, the uncanny. Uh, how do you deal uh, with these, uh, with these uh, objects, which are the great kind of ecological dilemma of our our, our, our time. So, but it's not just a question, if you like, of, of thinking uh, backwards. Um, it's also a question of thinking uh, forwards. Um, in terms uh, of um, what is uh, sometimes uh, referred to as uh, nuclear uh, uh, semiotics. Um, this is a picture of the waste uh, isolation pilot project uh, in uh, New Mexico. Um, this is basically uh, a storage facility uh, for uh, nuclear uh, waste. Um, it's been built uh, to store uh, the uh, nuclear waste uh, uh, from the uh, US uh, and the idea, uh, once it's finally sealed in 2038, um, is that it will be um, uh, inviolate uh, for the next uh, 10,000 uh, uh, years. Uh, but one of the problems that, that was faced um, by uh, the people who built uh, this facility um, was um, how would you let people know in thousands of years time that there were dangerous materials in uh, this uh, particular place, that they should not go near uh, these uh, materials. Um, so the Environmental Protection Agency uh, in the States uh, set up a human interference uh, task force um, whose, uh, if you like, task uh, was to come up uh, with some way of communicating um, the toxicity of these uh, materials uh, to uh, future uh, humans. Um, the facility has been in the Yucca Mountain and in the New uh, Mexican 
uh, desert. Um, so the panels uh, came up with various ideas, hostile architectures is called, uh, of having very large stone pillars, um, lots of um, dangerous uh, steel uh, spikes. Uh, other people had the idea of producing pictograms uh, or petroglyphs, um, which would um, uh, have particular images. One of the, the most popular was uh, Munch's, Edvard Munch's The Scream, um, that this would be represented iconically to warn people off uh, what was uh, inside. Uh, another idea was to have aeolian instruments um, that would uh, be modulated in such a way that the desert winds uh, of uh, New Mexico uh, would uh, produce uh, sound in the D minor chord, uh, which is associated uh, with uh, sadness. Um, but Thomas Seabock, um, the uh, linguist and, and semiotician, um, uh, suggested um, uh, what he called an active communication system. And um, what this active communication system uh, involved uh, was the uh, comp was literature, um, uh, producing a literature uh, for future uh, worlds, uh, producing stories, uh, um, uh, myths, uh, folkloric uh, tellings, um, uh, talking about the danger associated uh, with this place. Um, and uh, Seabock uh, advocated the creation of uh, what he kind of called rather grandly uh, an atomic priesthood um, that would, from generation to generation, be involved in the retelling, the reconceptual, uh, reconceptualization, the reformulation uh, of these stories. So in other words, uh, what he was talking about um, was a sense of deep time uh, going into the, the, the future that would involve a form of uh, endless uh, translation. So just as the kind of the relationship with, with deep time from the, the past uh, involves um, through literary expression, uh, this, this careful uh, negotiation uh, with translational uh, issues. Uh, similarly, we can see the kind of centrality uh, to the literature in terms of this active communication system uh, that uh, Seabrook conceives of for a, a world uh, uh, literature as something that involves a translation at its, uh, its, its, its heart. Um, I was um, going to talk um, uh, about the uh, the third element, the uh, plantation scene, but I am aware uh, of um, how uh, little uh, time uh, we have. Um, in, in just a, a, a small number of words, um, this is basically um, uh, a concept that has been uh, developed to describe how the form of uh, economic and ecological extractivism that uh, characterizes uh, our contemporary world uh, was really sketched out and formulated uh, with the creation of, of slave uh, plantations. Um, and what I would argue is that central to the notion of the plantation scene is uh, the dual form of translation, the, uh, the spatial displacement uh, of peoples uh, and that involving uh, forms uh, of uh, symbolic and, and cultural uh, translation, um, which, if you like, inform uh, extractivism. So in order to think about extractivism um, in the, uh, the contemporary moment, um, I'm interested in how translation uh, figures uh, in the Caribbean uh, world and how uh, Caribbean uh, writers and translators uh, offer us a way of thinking uh, through uh, world literature uh, translation through the prism uh, of the plantation scene. Um, but um, uh, as I said a, a few moments ago, um, it's one thing to uh, evoke the notion of deep time. Uh, it's another to get swallowed up in it entirely. Um, so I, I will uh, conclude uh, my uh, lecture there. Uh, thank you.